Hi folks, Kevin here. Well, it's January 31st, uh, 2018, and uh, this is going to be a single response to a question that I got last night. So it's an Ask Me Anything, and it's about diet related to glaucoma. And I'll read you uh, the question. Kevin, I, I had eye surgery a couple of months ago, and I don't think it was as, as successful as the doctors do. Today I was watching a site that made smoothies out of aboriginal age-old special products that slowly increase your vision back to normal. Uh, I have some concerns about that statement, uh, but I'll go on. I know you and Thea are big smoothies, are big into smoothies, so I was wondering is there any truth in any Miracle Vision smoothies? I couldn't find the site to ask questions. I couldn't find the site to ask questions about the authenticity and it seemed they were only interested in setting up sales program. I would appreciate any help uh, on this subject. Thank you. Uh, I asked back and I, and I said, uh, you, know, you know, what is the, the, uh, the eye disease and surgically wrote back glaucoma and cataracts. I asked, well, do you have open angle glaucoma? Uh, and he wrote back, I don't know, uh, there was a lot of pressure in my eyes, uh, and I think it's had they, and, and they had to release it. I will be going to my eye doctors next week. What are some questions I should ask when I, when I see him again? I just think we become part of a herd that doctors rope on in it into scare and reap from the insurance companies and the government to make money. And I'd say that those thoughts and concerns are, are real thoughts and concerns that so many folks uh, experience or, or have feelings about. They, they feel like they're just being herded through. Let's see it, they, they speak quickly. So there's a couple of things. So whenever you go to a doctor, and, and I'm gonna go through several things and hopefully this is gonna be a relatively short presentation. Um, the, I'm sweating a little bit, I'm on the third floor, excuse my, my appearance. A couple of things, uh, yes, it's, it, people get that experience. So how to deal with feeling that way? I think pre, uh, preparing yourself with always bringing someone with you, so two people being there to ask questions and all, and whenever you get information, so what I recommend is bringing, you know, nowadays, uh, your smartphones have a recording device. Practice using that before you go. Make sure it's fully charged. Ask the doctors that okay, we can record the information that you you give me. Then you can go home and do research. And as I've talked before about some of the places using Google Scholar, uh, using PubMed, Medline, or if it's diet related, going to nutritionfacts.org. I went there and I pulled up two short videos that, from uh, Dr. Gregor that I'm going to include in this, but it's by no means um, uh, thorough. <laughs> Dr. Gregor did a great job with both of these uh, presentations. However, th this is such, such a, an enormous complex uh, interaction of health-related issues, and, uh, and I'll stop there before I go on any further. So, uh, yes, Thea and I are both into smoothies, and smoothies certainly can help. However, when two, two additional things. When you're getting the impression from a company through ads on their site or to get to their next level uh, to get the super secret information that you have to pay some money up front or pay for a significant webinar, and you're not completely confident of what you're going to get out of your that expense, then I would say don't do it. They're showing you, they're showing you who they are. You know, have the responsibility to recognize they're telling you who who they are. They're there for the financial gain. Um, not that everyone doesn't deserve to get to get uh, compensated for the work that they do. I do believe that as well. With uh, you know what sort of questions to ask? Uh, it depends on where your your knowledge base is to start out with. And so in this presentation, I'm going to give some basic anatomy, some physiology, some standard medical treatments, some standard uh, surgical laser type therapies, 
how the diagnosis is made, those sorts of things I'm going to do in this video. And then I'm going to play two videos from Dr. Greger's uh, site on how to uh, prevent glaucoma, the open angle glaucoma, the more common type, and uh, anthocyanins and the role that they play as far as reducing it. And I'm also going to give a teaser on, you know, on the U.S. standard American diet, the relative, uh, the percentage of deficiencies based on many of the micronutrients. This isn't all the micronutrients. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more to come in the future over uh, regarding many of these different topics and they all stem back to that one video that I'll link up there, Lifestyle Medicine, uh, and I think a great source for, place for you to do some research and, and all is going to nutritionfacts.org and I did, and I'll link another link there that's uh, about the, uh, the Daily Dozen that Dr. Greger uh, writes about in, in his book, How Not to Die from These Different Diseases. I know sometimes these, these texts and this information seems that it's, it can be absolutely overwhelming and you may not feel that you have the, ne the necessary knowledge base. However, I think we're all capable of learning these things. I'm an example of someone who, you know, who has made it to this point, but there were all those obstacles to learning throughout the whole process. So I'm a firm believer that all of us can learn. And as we can network together uh, as a, building s small support groups of people who are interested in, in their health and their friends' health and all. I think that there's power in numbers as far as, as doing it. And, and in that lifestyle medicine, I talked about the, you know, the, uh, the culture uh, as well, you know, tribal leadership, that book. So without any further uh, <laughs> me babbling on, I'm going to start the, the, uh, the presentation. I'm going to record over the PowerPoint slides that I've made so that hopefully that'll make sense. I'm going to try tweaking my audio this time. Hopefully it's a little bit better. Then I'm going to play two videos from uh, Dr. Greger and then come back with just some closing statements. So hang in there. Glaucoma. Can diet help? Well, the, the good news is, yes, it can. There's certainly evidence that it can prevent uh, the, uh, the advancement or the, the onset of glaucoma. And uh, certainly anthocyanins, as we'll get into, can help help to halt any of those blue pigmented fruits and vegetables can halt the progression of glaucoma with open angle glaucoma. So what is glaucoma? Glaucoma is really a group of different diseases that uh, that result in increased intraocular pr pressure (IOP). Uh, it damages the retina and it damages the optic nerve and it can ultimately lead to blindness. So here's an example on your lower right hand screen of normal vision. You can see all the way out around the periphery. That's without moving your eyes. You don't see any shadows around the peripheral edges as in early glaucoma. And really these videos, these uh, images, upper right hand corner shows more advanced glaucoma and then extreme glaucoma in the uh, upper left hand corner. Uh, this would be the opposite of macular degeneration where the central vision is lost and you can see the perifer periphery. So let's look a little bit at some of the anatomy. So the windshield of the eye is a cornea. That's this gray uh, semicircular area out here. And then the iris is right here and we all have uh, different colors. Some people have brown, I have hazel, some people have blue irises. That's a part that, that expands and opens up the pupil in it when, when it's dark outside or uh, it closes it when we're outside and we go out into the bright light. So the pupillary window is uh, either constricts or radiates as a result of the iris involuntary motion in humans. In some birds, like the owls, the iris is, uh, is uh, con controlled by the birds themselves. So. The anterior cavity includes both the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber, as opposed, and those are both filled with aqueous humor. That's the fluid, like water-like fluid. In the back, behind the lens and behind the ciliary body, 
uh, encompassing the area where the, where the retina is, is the vitreous humor, and that is the posterior cavity. So we're going to talk about, with glaucoma, we're going to talk about the uh, posterior chamber and the anterior chamber. And uh, a couple of structures here w w on the closer side to the cornea from the iris is this uh, trabecular mesh work in here. And, uh, and here is an, an area, and these are all components, and it looks like sponge or cardboard, if you look at corrugated cardboard. And this is where fluid drains out of the eye, goes out into the, uh, the uh, ultimately into the episcleral vessels, which are those red vessels on the white part of the eye on the outside. This part of the, of the cornea is clear. You see through it if you if you're, uh, have normal, uh, a normal health state. So back here, near where the ciliary body is, there's a ciliary epithelium that blood that comes into the eyeball uh, it exudes this aqueous humor, humor through the ciliary epithelial cells. That goes out and drains out through the posterior, <coughs> excuse me, the aqueous humor after it's produced by the ciliary epithelium come out, comes out through the uh, posterior chamber and enters the an anterior chamber as it exits out through the pupil. So now it's out into the, into the anterior chamber and we have to drain the fluid. It, there's, there's, there's a set amount of fluid and a set uh, intraocular pressure. And if we produce more fluid than we drain out, then we can develop glaucoma. So that aqueous humor is going to come down and go to out through this trabecular meshwork. So here it's shown in cross section. Here it's showing in, as, as you're looking at it directly across. And the fluid is going to flow through these chambers, out through the canal of Schlem, and down in through the aqueous veins, and it'll exit the, to the surface and get into the episcleral vessels way out here. Those are the red vessels on the surface of the eye. So we produce it, a little artery comes in here, the epithelial cells lining in this area produce the aqueous humor. It goes from the posterior chamber through the anterior chamber, and once it's in the anterior chamber, it filters out through the trabecular meshwork and then through the various vessels and going to the, uh, to, the, to the outer surface of the eye vessels. So hopefully that makes sense. So glaucoma, part of the drainage systems becomes blocked when we have uh, glaucoma. Uh, fluid can't easily drain from the eye. The anterior chamber uh, pressure builds up and we get a pressure greater than 21 millimeters of mercury, uh, which damages all of the, the tissues within the eye itself. And, and this goes back all the way to the retina and to the optic nerve. And, uh, and, and it can be uh, permanent if it's great enough pressure for long enough and can lead to blindness. So let's look at the optic nerve. The optic nerve is a cranial nerve. It transmits transmits the impulses, electrical impulses, uh, from the, the retina. And so this is a chemical uh, reaction. So if we, it, so back in here, so the eyeball is actually facing to our left. This is the cornea here. This is the lens. So this is the anterior chamber. This is the posterior chamber. Uh, this is where the vitreous humor is. And this showing that it's, it's really well circulated. So this is a vitreous humor in here, but it's not red color, but the, uh, the back of the retina looks red when you look back there. You'll see a little sort of a tan or whitish disc back here, and that's where the optic nerve comes out through. And we'll look at that. But they've taken a small little cross section of the retina here and shown it, and it's several layers deep. And at the back of the uh, retina are where the rods are and where the cones are. And so we have three different color cones, and they, they take up the various color, so we have color vision. And the rods take up the, the amount of light. So the more rods you have, the better you can see at nighttime. And so some species, certainly the, the, the nighttime dwelling animals, such as owls and 
uh, you know, you, you'll actually see a reflective layer in some animals' eyes because they have a tapetum lucidum, which uh, enhances the amount of light absorption through the uh, rods. But anyways, so this is uh, all of these structures, these tissues here can get damaged and the optic nerve can get damaged as well. So here we are looking through the eyeball using ophthalmoscope and looking back here and so we can see the optic disc which is the optic nerve here and we see the, the retina. Sometimes in some injuries we'll see detachment of the retina and here are the vessels of the retina as well. So if the pressure gets great enough, blood supply gets, gets damaged, the venous return gets, gets compressed, the nerves get damaged, and ultimately can result in blindness. So there's different types of glaucoma. The most common is open angle glaucoma, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. The second is closed angle glaucoma, and that usually is a sudden onset from what I've seen in cases where there's pain, redness, blurry vision, headaches, nausea, and there might be a visual halo around things. And then there's normal tension uh, glaucoma, which I've never seen. And, and I remember, I'm a veterinary internist, and I would always use the ophthalmologist if, uh, if the patients could afford, the clients could afford it. So uh, I think that, that diet uh, can certainly be, play a role in open angle and the normal tension uh, glaucoma. So let's look at the uh, open angle glaucoma. So here we have, sorry, I'm trying to get my mouse to work. Here's the iris, so the eyeball is facing left, the cornea of the eye is here, the lens is here, this is the iris, this is the cornea. And we're talking about this angle here. So this angle is wide open. If it were closed angle, we'd draw this iris being over closer to the, uh, to the um, cornea. And remember, fluid is, let's get my mouse back, fluid is produced down here at the ciliary epithelium, transits out between the lens and the iris, comes out into the anterior chamber and drains out in this area. So, uh, with open angle glaucoma, that's a, a more insidious process. It happens slowly and people may not recognize it right off the bat. So how is it diagnosed? Well, the, the two ways that, that I would use is using a tonopen, which measures intraocular pressure, and that's an example of the tip of it here. There's a little button here. We put a little condom-like uh, sterile um, uh, rubber uh, finger cot over the surface of it to prevent transmission, uh, you know, d contamination of the surface of the eye. And uh, this little instrument would uh, basically create uh, a change in the, in the, in the surface uh, uh, angle here and measure, estimate the intraocular pressure. Uh, it's an estimate of, of the intraocular pressure, but it's fairly accurate and you do it several times to get an accurate reading. This is the other way, is actually looking uh, you dilate the pupil and do a fundic exam with the, um, with the ophthalmic, ophthalmoscope. And, uh, and in severe cases or advanced cases, you, it's, it's, it's pretty darn apparent, as well as many other diseases that can, that can occur within the eye. So what are the treatments? So the medications are either used to decrease the intraocular pressure it, or increase the outflow of aqueous humor or decrease both the production and increase the outflow. So drugs that decrease intraocular pressure by decreasing the, the production of aqueous humor are beta adrenergic receptor antagonists and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Um, and I'll just say that the ones that decrease aqueous humor, prostaglandin analogs, and, uh, and then you have some that are alpha adrenergic agonists that do both. Uh, I, I would say I've had, I've had limited experience using these myself. It's almost always been the ophthalmologist that's, that's prescribed these medications and they've followed up with the, um, with the aspects of uh, measuring the intraocular pressures and seeing how well the eye health was after starting the patients on those medications. But I've had a fair number of patients that have had medical complications. Now, these were patients that I was also 
taken care of because of other chronic inflammatory conditions going on in their body, and it might change the um, the metabolic state of the patients. And I won't go into any further. So there, there, there are some adverse effects that can happen as a result of using these medical treatments. Then there's surgical uh, treatments using lasers. So one of the things that can be can be done. So here's the cornea. I'm trying to get this mouse to work. Cornea here iris here, this is an example of open angle glaucoma. So this trabecular meshwork here can be ablated, use the laser to wipe out this tissue here and allow the fluid to flow out. Now this would only work in, excuse me, this would only be an option if it was indeed open angle uh, glaucoma. If we had closed angle glaucoma where the iris was closer to the cornea, reducing the flow of aqueous humor, getting into that anterior chamber, then an iridotomy would be done, which you'd blow a little hole, burn a little hole right through the iris itself. So it could come from the posterior chamber through the anterior chamber and drain, drain out through the normal trabecular meshwork. And then uh, the other way is, is to, and this is the ciliary body back here and there's ciliary epithelium. And that's where the little arterioles come up through the ciliary epithelium and produce the aqueous humor. So you can actually wipe out some of those cells down in this uh, section here that actually are responsible for producing the aqueous humor. Uh, so, and that's what this talks about. It also talks about the possibility of putting shunts in as well. Uh, so when we get to diets, one of the videos that Dr. Uh, Gregor will talk about, and I believe this is the second of the two videos that I put together, is the anthocyanins, couple of papers he's going to show you where, where these anthocyanins, these are the blue pigments within the various vegetables. So here we have, uh, certainly we have the blackberries, the uh, mulberries, the blueberries, the uh, blue potatoes, blue sweet potatoes. These are the currants. Uh, Jim, you tasted these before and promptly spit them out. We have blue cabbage, blue corn. All of these things give us more anthocyanins. And there's a whole multitude of health benefits that I'm not really going to go into right now. Uh, all of these uh, amazing benefits. Now, this slide is another slide I'm going to be using in the future for, for uh, a few different presentations that I hope to do. And it really has to do with the uh, people on the standard American diet and the incidence of deficiency of these micronutrients. And your doctor and your blood work, and you might feel absolutely fantastic, but over time as we get older and older, uh, this deficiency will take its toll ultimately, and it does take its toll. I wish I knew this information that I know now many years ago. Uh, uh, a researcher, uh, pretty well known, Bruce Ames, uh, developed a theory called triage therapy. And I'll talk more about that, but it, it basically saying that uh, these micronutrients, although they have so many metabolic roles in our body that prevent aging, protect, prevent cancer, prevent uh, age-related disease processes, inflammatory, immune-mediated disease, asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, um, uh, all the neurodegenerative disorders as well. All of these diseases, uh, these micronutrients play vital roles. But in the triage therapy, what we find out is, uh, I'm sorry, in the triage theory, uh, that these micronutrients, although they're used in multiple places, if it's, if it's being used for something that's absolutely essential, well, it, those nutrients get shuttled to that system. And those ones that are less essential, uh, which will result in chronic debilitating disease, but, it, but it'll prevent you from dying today, uh, then those add up and we're more likely to get, uh, heart, you know, Cardio, uh, circulatory disease, whether it's erectile dys dysfunction, strokes, heart, heart attacks, um, chronic inflammatory diseases, and so on and so forth. So I'll have other videos in the future to, to talk about uh, all of these important micronutrients. And this is something that I'm always trying to talk about with, we are a society that's, that's, uh, that's becoming increasingly, alarmingly obese and uh, which means that our caloric intake 
far exceeds our nutrient intake. And, and then besides that, the other things that are the preservatives and the processing that's done to the foods that we're consuming it, are so detrimental to our body that it's, it's also a big concern. So that's why I'm a proponent, proponent of a nutrient dense, a high carbohydrate, and that means high fiber diet. And so we'll go over videos uh, explaining these, these various topics in the future. So let's move on to the two videos now. Glaucoma is the second leading cause of legal blindness in white women, but the number one cause of blindness in African American women. That's one reason researchers chose a population of African American women to study the effects of fruit and vegetable consumption on glaucoma risk. But the other reason is because they were specifically interested in foods with the highest concentration of those eye-protecting phytonutrients like zeaxanthin, kale, and collard greens. But you'd be lucky if you could find one in ten white people eating even a single serving a month, whereas that was a no-brainer for African Americans. What'd they find? Well, as I've stressed over the years, all fruits and vegetables are not the same, whether you ever ate bananas or had one or more bananas every day it didn't seem to matter much, but eating a couple oranges every week was associated with dramatically lower risk. Not orange juice, though. You can drink orange juice every day, and it didn't seem to matter. A similar finding with peaches. Fresh peaches seemed to work, but canned peaches didn't. Similarly, vegetables in general as a catch-all term didn't seem to matter. For example, whether you ate a green salad twice a week, once a week, or zero times a week didn't seem to matter when it came to reducing glaucoma risk. But you know how pitiful most people's salads are. Here's the kale and collard greens. Check it out. Just two or three servings a month was associated with half the risk of glaucoma compared to once a month or less. White people take note, as you may need it even more. The lighter our eye color, the more greens we need to eat. Blue eyes let a hundred times more light through, so people with blue or gray eyes appear significantly more vulnerable to damage compared to brown or black, with green and hazel somewhere in the middle. It's interesting. Carrots appear to be less protective in black women compared to white women. They suggest it could be differences in food preparation methods. Uh, perhaps the African-American subjects tended to eat carrots raw, limiting the absorption of certain nutrients, while they chopped and prepared their collard greens with oil, making the nutrients more bioavailable, because the absorption of carotenoid phytonutrients depends on the presence of fat, which is why I encourage people to eat nuts or seeds with their greens, a little tahini sauce or something. Why not just take a zeaxanthin pill? Well, we don't know what exactly it is in these wonderful foods that's working their wonders, so it, it may be better to just recommend folks eat them rather than supplements. And in fact, people that take calcium or iron supplements may be doubling, quadrupling, or even septupling their odds of glaucoma. Better to just get most of our nutrients from produce, not pills. Once we preserve the pigment in our retinal pigment epithelial cells, we need to keep them alive, which may be where anthocyanin phytonutrients come in. Anthocyanins, from the Greek anthos, meaning flower, and kyanos, meaning blue, blue flower, are natural plant pigments that make pansies look purple, and turns green cabbage into purple cabbage, yellow corn into purple corn, brown rice to purple rice, white potatoes to blue potatoes, orange carrots to purple carrots, and turns blueberries into, well, blueberries, and keeps blackberries black. As we age, our critical RPE layer starts to break down, but we may be able to decelerate that aging with blueberries. Here are human RPE cells in a petri dish exposed to various stressors. Uh, the ones bathed in blueberry anthocyanins had fewer free radicals, and a lower proportion of aged cells suggesting that blueberries and these other red, blue, purple pigmented fruits and vegetables may help prevent age-related macular degeneration, 
and blue berries may be especially important for blue eyes, as we saw in an earlier video. Preventing is nice, but what if we already have a disease like glaucoma, an incurable eye disease in which our optic nerve, which connects our eyes to our brain, starts deteriorating, we start losing our visual fields. A few years ago, Japanese researchers showed that they could apparently halt the progression of disease with black currents. Uh, they gave people black currents for six months, significantly boosting the blood flow to their optic nerve. The results suggested that black currents might be a safe and valuable option, but it was not double-blind, no control group, so I didn't report it when it was initially published, but here we go, finally. Glaucoma patients split into two groups. Half got black currents, the other half didn't. Let's see what happened. Here's a measure of the deterioration of their visual fields in both groups in the two years leading up to the beginning of the study. Worse, 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 despite taking the best glaucoma drugs on the market. Then the study starts. The berry-free control group continued to worsen. But the berries appeared to stop the disease in its tracks. One year later, two years later, and since there's no downside, only good side effects to berries, in my professional opinion, everyone with glaucoma should be eating berries every day. Okay, I hope that uh, looking at those two, two videos uh, shed some light on ways that very important uh, phytonutrients that are contained within um, our green leafy vegetables. We'll be talking about cruciferous vegetables in the future and their role, uh, talking about so, some of the phytates and the roles of the, in the beans. Certainly, you saw berries are so important to be, and that, that has to be one of our parts in our, in our diet. So this screen is up here to help, to help remind us, and I'll put a link in the upper uh, right-hand corner that uh, reviews uh, Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen. And this is just a reminder of the things that we should be taking into our body if we want to decrease not just glaucoma, but all of the other age-related inflammatory disease processes that our bodies undergo. And if not, well, you always have the option of taking all the medications and, and leaving, uh, leading a life that's probably not as dynamic and fulfilling as if you treat yourself well with a really good diet. Well, I really appreciate you sitting through this video. Sorry this one came up so quickly, uh, but I thought this was an important one to get out there. Uh, if you thought it was helpful in any way, please subscribe. Please give it a thumbs up. Feel free to leave comments and questions uh, about this. I'll get to them as soon as I can. Things are starting to get a little bit busy around here right now. And please share it with whatever social media um, avenues that, that you pr prefer to use. Let your friends and family know about these health-related issues. I think they're really important and can, can help our quality of lives. So thanks so much for watching, folks, and have a great day. Bye-bye now.